And that's what this body of Christ is. It's a team. It's a team who works together. <laughs> works together to bring glory to God and to encourage us in how to do this walk. Because every one of us is coming from a place. We all have history. We've all messed up. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. So what are we doing in this place? We're not coming in here showing how holy we are. We're saying, Lord, we are coming in showing our desperation for you. Our need for you. And God says, I am here for you. The way he was here for Susan, God is here for you. How we respond to that will determine how our life pans out. It's all about our response to God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever should believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. This gospel message is not a message of condemnation. It's not a message of, yeah, you see, you messed up, therefore you are written off. That is not the message. We bring the good news. The good news was a few weeks ago, Easter time, Passover. The good news is that Jesus died on the cross. And you say, oh, how can that be good news? Jesus died. Because when Jesus died on the cross, a lot of things happened. He declared, it is finished. And a whole lot of stuff was finished. A whole lot of nonsense. No longer do we have to take a dove or a sheep or a this or a that and take its life for its blood to flow so that our sins can be covered because this covenant that Jesus has introduced to us is a far better covenant. It's not a covenant of covering of sin. And this you need to grasp, folks. Your sin is not covered. It is done away with. That letter of all the things you owed, all the things you did and what you needed to pay, it's been nailed to the cross. No longer are we coming with the blood of animals, the sacrifice of animals. We come with the blood of Jesus, a better, a new and better covenant. A covenant which does not cover sin, it blots it out. As far as the east is from the west, so far is your sin taken from you. And how do we as people respond to that? Because the whole Christian walk is one of response. How do you respond? Well, the fleshly heart. What is a fleshly heart? It is a heart that is still functioning in accordance with the pattern of this world. It is an unregenerated mind which is still thinking about worldly system and what I can get out of the world. The unrepentant mind, the fleshly mind, the worldly mind will say, well, if my sin is completely blotted out and taken as far as the east is from the west. I can now delve deeper into sin because I am under grace. That is the fleshly mind. That is the mind of the world. That is how we as people would compute it. But that's not what God's word says. The way we are is to respond to the grace of God is to say, Lord, I'm sorry. Sorry for my sin. Thank you for your sacrifice. Help me. Fill me with your spirit, Lord. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. So that I can live differently. That is the call. The call from Jesus is that you are a new creation. You need to walk in it. Let me see if I can get into my message for today. Because I was wondering where the Lord's taking this this morning. But it's tying in, and he's telling me, no, no, he's just giving me a new intro. Because none of that so far I've even thought of mentioning today. He's giving me a new intro into Psalm 1. And Psalm 1, if you want to follow in this 
light deprived state. Psalm 1 starts off with the following verse. Ble well, the first word, blessed. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. You've got our attention. Because in the days we are living, we need the blessing of God. If you hadn't noticed, it's pretty tough out there. I say that tongue-in-cheek, obviously. Because every one of us has noticed how tough it is. We need the blessing and favor of God. And sometimes as God's people, we go through stages where we feel like we are not blessed. Where, where is God? We can go through such times. But as I've preached recently, even when you can't hear or see God, He is there. He has not left you. He has not forsaken you. He is there. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. I'm going to read the whole of Psalm 1 to you, which is quite short. It's not a long psalm. But this first verse is going to be the verse that I'm going to keep hammering on this morning. Because firstly, you need to, dis you need to recognize in this opening line that there are two different sets of people. The first person is blessed, and when, when God says you are blessed, you are blessed indeed. But even in your blessing, there are times you can go through winter seasons. There are times you can go through tough times when the Lord is growing you, or the Lord is, is refining you, and He's maybe getting rid of some stuff that you are stubbornly hanging on to, and eventually you just, out of desperation, let go. Sometimes the Lord takes us to a place like that. But never feel that God has deserted you. If you know there's something between you and God that's not right, and I'm not asking that you go and you try and find something. If there is something that God wants you to work on, His finger will be on that button, you will know about it. If you are not responding to that thing, you can go through some challenges which you didn't need to go through. Humble yourself before the Almighty God. Wherever he's putting his finger on a button, say, yes, Lord, I'm sorry, Lord, that's wrong, Lord. Help me, Lord. But you need to recognize that this scripture, this verse, Psalm 1, verse 1, is talking about two different sets of people. And the way this first psalm starts off makes me think of the Beatitudes. Remember, you know the Beatitudes? The Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, where Jesus is blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of, God, of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. This is how Jesus started off his sermon on the mount. What is he giving us here? He's giving us like a menu of the things that he values. All of these things, he's saying, blessed are the meek, poor in spirit, lowly, etc., etc. These are things which Jesus values. These are not things the world values. The world despises the things of God. And we, in our mind, need to be able to differentiate between that which the world has told us is important and that which God tells us is important. We need to come back to that, to that state, moving backwards and saying, okay, Lord, I'm going to climb out of all my cleverness, all my stubbornness, and all of my worldly thinking. And I'm going to see here, these are things that you are telling me are important. These are attributes which Jesus values. Do you value them? Because the world does not value them. The world does not value meekness. The world has a wrong definition of meekness. 
The world looks at meekness and sees weakness. Jesus looks at meekness and he sees controlled strength. To be meek, it is controlled strength. There are some in, in wives, you are called to, to be in submission to your husband. But I know some wives who are much stronger in many ways than their husband. But in meekness, they choose to submit to the husband because that is what God tells them to do. It is a choice. It's not to say you are lower, you are less than. No, that person may be stronger in many, many, many areas. But because God has put an authority structure in place, the person chooses to say, yes, Lord, I will. For the husband, sometimes I meet men who think they are above Jesus. But as a husband, you are called into an authority structure with Christ being the head. You need to be looking to Jesus and seeking what does Jesus want for you and your family. And you lead your family in accordance to that. Not accordance to what you want and what you think. We need to reevaluate the things in our heart and our mind that we think are important. And that we are basing our identity upon. And we need to come back. And as of, it wasn't so long ago, from this pulpit I was preaching about us coming back to who we were. Who God created us to be. Who was I originally before this world distorted me? And gave me stinking thinking. When God made me in a certain way to be compassionate and to be gentle and to be meek. But the world the whole time is saying, you can't do that. You must be strong. You must be tough. You must give as good as you take. As good as you get. And you start thinking, okay, I've got to do this because everyone is telling me I must do this. But God is not telling you to do that. Who are we listening to? Who do we fear? The beginning of wisdom is the fear of God. Do you fear God or do you fear man? We've got to move away from the fear of man. And we've got to move looking into the loving eyes of a father to say, Lord, what you think about me, what you say about me is all that counts. It doesn't matter if everybody on your team, sports team, it doesn't matter if everybody at your work, it doesn't matter if everybody in this world says something different. Lord, what do you say? Because that's all that's important. Here, we are given in the Beatitudes. Jesus is giving us some things. And he's referring, these people are blessed. These are are traits which are significant to Jesus. And we need to aspire to such traits. We need to value them so that we are reaching out for the traits that Jesus says are important. Back to Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. So the first person who Jesus describes as blessed is one who is walking in accordance with godly wisdom and instruction. But there's a second person in this first verse. And yes, we're still on the first verse, but no, you're not here for the whole morning. I'm going to make my point. Bear with me. Bear with me. The second type of the person is on the opposite end of the spectrum. He does not fall into the blessed category. And there are three levels described. The first is the ungodly. The ungodly, from the Hebrew word reshem, which is to be unjust. This is a person who renders no one their due. He withholds from God, he withholds from society, and he withholds from himself even. He renders no one their due. The ungodly is one who does not have God inside of him. He is without God in the world. So this is the first description of the three classes of people that the psalm is talking about. The second description of this group is, is classed as sinners from the, from the Hebrew word chetem, which is to miss the mark, to pass over the prohibited lines, to transgress. This is the second level. This one doesn't only do what is not good. He doesn't only withhold from people like the first one we looked at but he actually does evil the former was without god but this one 
But the former was without God, but he wasn't desperately wicked. He was just without God. This one adds outward transgression to the sinfulness of his heart. So you've got the ungodly, and now you've got the sinner. The sinner is at another level to the ungodly. And then there's a third level. A third level which is even deeper, even worse. It is the scornful. From the Hebrew word litzim, which is to mock or to deride. This one lives in open breach and mockery of God's word. He turns all that God stands for into ridicule. Doing what he can to break down those who are seeking God. Three levels. Progressively worse levels. As the sinner exceeds the ungodly, so the scornful exceeds the sinner. Taking the verse a little deeper, we see other words coming through. Words like walk, stand, and sit. Three more words adding something. The ungodly man is one who is uninfluenced by God. The sinner is one who adds transgression to his ungodliness. And the scornful... He is like the atheist who makes a mockery of everything sacred. The ungodly man walks. The sinner stands. The scornful man sits down in his way of iniquity. The godly man has his counsel. The sinner has his way. And the scornful has his seat. The ungodly is unconcerned about the things of God, such as salvation. For himself as, and as, as well as for others round about him, he has no interest in it. And he counsels them in it, and he advises them to adopt his way of thinking, which is the worldly pattern of thinking. Telling them not to bother with praying or reading the Bible or repenting. That there is no merit in these things. That you only need to be honest and maybe mind your own business. To do good once in a while and you'll be fine. Now, blessed is the man who walks not in this counsel, who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, who does not adopt his way of thinking, even though that person is trying to influence him, who is not influenced by such a negative way, but continues doing that which he knows to be right, that which he reads in God's word. Blessed is that person. The sinner has his own favorite and personalized way of transgressing. As you know, every single one of us here has, over our time, had our personal weaknesses of sin that can be different for everyone, although there will be some commonality. One is a drunkard, one is a thief, one is a liar. There's many different things to transgress. Each one forging his own path according to his own desires. The prophet Isaiah tells us, let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord, and he will have mercy on them, and to our God, for he will freely pardon. You see, the wicked have their way. Prophet Isaiah says, let the wicked forsake their way, their chosen way. Now, blessed is he who stands not in such a way. The one who doesn't adopt or follow that man's way. Blessed is he. Have you noticed that if you visit somebody who is a little thirsty, who is building up his right arm by lifting that glass repeatedly, how he doesn't want to drink alone, if you visit, come sit, but go your top. He doesn't want to do it alone. He wants you to walk in his way. He, wants, he doesn't want to feel bad because if you sit there and you have a Coke, he's going to feel bad about what he's having. So you've got to join in with him. Blessed is the man who does not get influenced in such a way. When you do that, you are following in his way. And the enemy has a plan for you along that route. Boss up. But there is another way, and his name is Jesus. And you most certainly should follow in his way. For he is the way. And anyone seeking another path outside of Jesus, whatever that path may be, however pretty that path may look, however many flowers there may be growing on the side of that path, if it is a path that is not the path of Jesus, it is a false path and it will lead to destruction. 
for he is the way. He alone is the way. Anyone seeking another path outside of Jesus has lost the way. They found another way, but they have lost the way. For Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father but by him. Ageku uzukubaba, ngapandla kwami. There is no other way. There is one way. In the scornful man's mind, he has all understanding, all wisdom, all knowledge regarding spiritual things. He knows. He sat down in his stance, and he won't budge. And he has made a mockery of sin. His conscience is seared, and he is a believer in all unbelief. Now, blessed is the man who sits not in his seat. Let us not become comfortable and settled in that which we know. You may meet many people who will vehemently deny that there is a God. They will tell you for sure they know there is no God. Do they know all things? Do they know how the blood in an ant's thin spindly leg gets down to their toe and back again? Can they make that happen? Do they know how the Trees at a certain season of the year will change color into beautiful autumn reds and oranges and yellows. And then they will fall down, but in the springtime, new growth will start. Can they make that happen? Do they understand the intricacies of life? Do they understand what people used to call a simple cell is more complicated than the most powerful computer? Man in his own thinking thinks he is so clever. And we know nothing. We think the, the person who says there is no God says so because he knows everything. Does he even know 50% of what's to be known? Not a chance. He'd be lucky if he knew 10%. He'd be lucky if he knew 5%. Could God exist in that which he does not know? And yet, in his stubbornness and in his stupidity, he claims to know so much that there is no God. That person has sat down in their understanding and thinking and has made their stance. This is it. He who walks according to the counsel of the ungodly will soon look on the way of sinners and start to take on their mindset, ever moving towards being a partaker of, of their sin. He who has abandoned himself to transgression will start to become hardened in his heart, seared in his conscience, and start to sit down with the scornful and turn the things of God into ridicule. We've got to be careful of this progression because sin is a progression. It takes you here and it starts to bring you down. One evil act leading to an even worse one. And he who receives an axe on bad counsel may soon be partaking in evil things. And he who continues in such things may well end up excluding God from life completely. Sitting down in the way of scornful, excluding God thinking they have all knowledge and all understanding, an enlightened one. Meantime, the darkness is living so desperately upon them. Like a heavy blanket, a drape that has been placed over them, they sit in their darkness. To him we reverse the words of David. And we read as follows. Cursed is the man who walks in the counsel of the ungodly, who stands in the path of sinners, who sits in the seat of the scornful. Let's get back to, let's get back to our Psalm 1. We're on verse 2, by the way. But his delight is in the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. 
For us as New Testament believers, what is he talking about? God's word. God's revealed word which he has given to us for our understanding. Blessed is the man who walks in that. What is the result of one who delights himself in the Lord and meditates on his word continually? He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bring forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. Picture yourself driving through a desert, mile after mile. You go on and on, and all you see is sand. Nothing's growing. The barrenness of that desert is a reflection of some people's lives. Barren. It's just sand. There is no water to sustain life. This morning we were calling on the Lord to rain down upon us because we recognize without Him we are barren. It is desert. It is just sand. But when God starts to rain down, there is new life. We recognize our life comes from God. In the desert, there's no water to sustain life. There's no opportunity for things to grow or for many animals to live. A barrenness, a wasteland, like going to the beach, but there's no sea. Can you imagine? Then you come across an oasis where there is water. Suddenly, in the middle of this whole wasteland, there is life. Trees are growing. Animals are drinking. Life is happening. It doesn't matter whether it's raining at the time or not. Here, there is water. And with water comes life. God is saying this is a picture of you. His desire is that you are planted next to such water. That this life will continually be in you and flowing through you. Whether it is raining on the outside or not. Because He is supplying undercurrents that you are drawing up. It doesn't matter to the tree planted by the river if it's going through a dry season. The water is flowing. It has water, whether there is rain or not. The tree is drinking. Its leaves do not wither. It can produce fruit irrespective of the circumstances of life. This is God's desire for you. That whatever you do, in that you may prosper. In Jeremiah 29, 11, which is the founding scripture for Jeremiah's hope. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. That promise is to every single baby conceived. I know the plans I have for you. God still knows the plans he has for you. He hasn't forgotten. You might say, well, I'm 30, 40, whatever years old. God knows those plans and God does not forget them. Let us respond to him. Let us make sure we are planted by those waters, that our roots are going down, that we are drinking from his supply and not looking for a supply that is outside of him. To say, Lord, where is the reign of the world? Where is this of the world that I need? No, let us go deep down so that even through the times of drought, when it is dry and things are drying up around, that you are sustained through the life of Jesus. That is God's plan for you. The problem with a scripture like this, Jeremiah 29, 11 and Psalm 1, is that as people, we read it and we start to compute that if I come to church, I can be prosperous in worldly wealth. In other words, I have no interest in seeking God, but I have every interest in seeking prosperity. And this is where it all breaks down. Let's come back to our opening scripture. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stand in the path of sinners nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bring forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither. 
And whatever he does shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. We have recognized two types of people in this passage. This opening chapter of the book of Psalms. Both function in the world at the same time. Both have equal opportunity. Both get to make their own choices. In Matthew 13, verse 30, Jesus says, Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell my harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned, then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. The time for harvest is upon us. We are in the autumn season of history. In the autumn, you harvest. Before the winter. The harvest is soon to be brought in. The weeds represent those who have chosen to reject God's free offer of salvation. They are seated in their lost state. They are the weeds that have no value. The wheat which has value are those who have received Jesus who are walking in His way, who delight themselves in the Lord, who are hiding His Word in in their heart and delighting themselves in it and walking in it. They are patterning themselves according to God's Word and aligning with Jesus. Where do you fit in? Wheat or weed? Hey man, I want some weed. (laughs) Well, That weed may cause you to sit down in the seat of the scornful if you're not careful. I know you call it a holy herb. But we need to be wheat. That which has substance. That which has value and meaning to the Lord. That which He is coming to harvest and to bring into His barn. What does Jesus mean to you? How significant is it that Jesus, Son of God, allowed Himself to be crucified on a cross for you? How significant is it? Is that of meaning to you? Is it of value? So that you could go free? He would pay your price so you could go free? Free to take counsel from God's Word and God's Spirit. Free to walk in His way and follow Him who is the way. Free to sit at His feet and to enjoy His presence. Where do you stand this morning? I choose to be wheat. I choose to value God's Word. I choose to respond when He puts a finger on a button. Being your pastor doesn't mean I've reached a state of perfection. It just means I've answered a call to say, yes, Lord. But I need to keep answering that call of saying, yes, Lord, every time it speaks. Because this side of the grave, there is no perfection in humanity. Jesus was the only perfect spotless lamb. The rest of us don't even come close. But do we have a heart to say, Lord, I want to be like you. Help me. I choose to be wheat. How about you? There may be people in here that have never received Jesus as their Lord and Savior. I am going to be at the front here after the service. I want you to come and speak to me. Even if you're not ready to make a commitment to make Jesus your Lord and Savior, come and speak to me. Jesus is coming soon to reap. His harvest. You need to make sure you fall into the wheat category and not the weed. So Lord, on that note, I lift these precious people up to you, Lord. 
And I ask that you continue stirring this message, Lord, whatever you are saying personally to them, that you would continue stirring them on this first psalm. It is a short psalm that introduces the psalms. But Lord, right from the outset, it tells us where we stand, and that is who you are. You are not a God who hides things. You are not a God of confusion. When we ask you, Lord, is there something in my life which displeases you? You do not hide it. You don't try to, to mask it. You show us. And then you expect us to respond positively. Lord, we receive the psalm along with all the rest of your word that we receive. And we meditate upon it. And I ask, Holy Spirit, that you would stir us. That you would bring to our recollection things that you have mentioned today over time, Lord. That we may get out of it that which you want to get out. And it may be something different for each person. Because you are a unique God that has a unique relationship with every one of us. So I lift these people up and I speak your blessing and your favor. I speak, Lord, an end of those bad seasons that people are going through. Those seasons, Lord, that are really bringing them to their knees. And Lord, that is sometimes what you are doing. You want to bring us to our knees. And the season will only end once we respond to you the way that you are calling us to respond. So I'm, I'm speaking, Lord, a, a, a quick response. That we would not go round the mountain for 40 years, but we would learn, Lord, first time round, to say, yes, Lord, Shh, yes, Lord, I'm on board with you. So I speak your blessing. I speak your favor. Lord, as this month draws to a close, I am speaking, Lord, your enabling ability for those who still need to achieve things before month end. An anointing for them, Heavenly Father, to be able to bring this month to a close in a good way. And Lord, I lift up next Saturday with Jeremiah's hope. And I speak, Lord, your blessing and your favor over that. Your blessing and your favor for every person that is being a part of that and coming to that. Lord, may this be a powerful time together. A good time. But also, Lord, a time when together, corporately, we join hands to make that which you have called for to come into being. In Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. Be blessed.